This is part of a series of videos on LC3 programming. I will take a slight departure from programming and talk about a concept which involve device interaction. That is, how does our <coughs> computer interact with devices? Devices can be thought of as being input devices, output devices, strictly input, strictly output, example of input device being a keyboard. An output device could be a display or a device that both does both input and output like a disk or your hard drive. So the the fundamental concept of inter interaction is done using a mechanism called memory mapped I.O. There's an alternative to memory mapped I.O. which is called port mapped I.O. The word I, the notation I.O. simply represents input and output. So the idea behind memory mapped I.O. is to use existing load and store instructions to read from and write to devices. That is, there are no special instructions for performing input and output. We just use our um, instructions that we're already familiar with, with instructions like um, LD, LDR, <coughs> LDI, and so on. And we use instructions like ST, STR, STI, like before. The alternative to this is what um, x86 uses. Um, by the way, LC3 uses a memory mapped I.O. and so do a lot of uh, other machines like ARM and so on. So port mapped I.O. is based on the notion that there are special instructions and we're talking about assembly instructions for interaction specifically in the case of x86 there's an instruction called in uh, for example in uh, has a uh, simple example of in is you would say in and you would say um, what register you're taking it from um, <clears throat> what 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 location you're reading it from as specified as an eight this is an eight bit address that you specify and the, this is the destination you're going to read from that from that particular address and put it into um, a register this is a general purpose register on on x86 just like we have r1 r2 r r0 r1 r2 there's a register called a and this is a 16-bit version of it uh, similarly there could be an out instruction like that there's an out instruction which has the same connotation uh, again it could take uh, from register ax it could take an address immediate 8 and this again is um, the in in one case we're sending we are we are uh, loading from a device or reading from a device this is to read from a device and this is to write to a device So to kind of get a sense of um, how device interaction really works, let's take a few steps back and revisit what we know about how the CPU interacts with, with memory. So we remember that CPU and memory interaction, so if we have memory in our sys memory 
on our system, we know that the interaction between the CPU and the memory is really done using the MAR and the MDR register. One is the address register and the data register. But really, the MAR and MDR registers, the MAR and the MDR registers are, don't physically, I mean, they do have a physical uh, expression, but um, the expression happens in terms of the address line and the and the data line. These are address lines and the I'm going to use a plural here lines and the data lines because each of these this is 16 bits for example on LC3 uh, on a different machine it could be 32 bits because the addresses on LC3 are 16 bits um, they on a different machine they could be 32 bits if the addresses are 32 bits so that's 16 bits also so there are lines there and we have a third line that is of interest to us which is our read write line so we we visualize this collective lines together as being our bus so when we want to read from memory or write from memory we'll write we'll put the address on the address bus and the memory looks at it and memory responds by putting the contents of that in the data line if it's a read if it's a write we do we follow a similar sequence which we which we explained which i explained in a different video so the cpu sits on the bus and so does the memory sit on the bus now in come our players new players into this game are our players in this new players in this game are our are input devices and output devices so here is an input device a keyboard and in my in our key our keyboard um, is also a device that sits on the bus so what uh, so does the display device and if there were another device, like we said, a disk, it would also sit on it. I'm using the disk as a, as a, as an extension of X LC3. LC3 only has these two uh, there on LC3, but the disk doesn't exist on LC3. But I'm going to use it to kind of make the case for um, uh, something more sophisticated and something from derived from the real world. So. Um, the idea behind behind our interaction then is that these keyboard and display devices they respond to specific addresses. The memory you can think of the memory as as a virtual um, map, if you will, a table of locations. But these this the keyboard only re responds to two addresses: F E zero 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 X F E. Uh, I keep forgetting we use X as our way of saying it and FE02 and this one only responds to FE0 uh, actually let's use uh, the right color here it responds to X FE00 and X FE02 and this one only responds to X FE04 and XFE06. Um, these are sometimes called device registers. So that's a 16-bit value that it holds on to, a 16-bit value that it holds on to, and so on. So we'll look at what these are. So suffice it to say, when when this address appears on the bus, the memory simply says, I do not have an answer for you. And the associated device, if it's a keyboard, that would respond. For example, there might be a different address, set of addresses for the disk. And 
um, if the disk were implemented on LC3, it would have a different address. The key difference between memory mapped I.O. So the key difference between this is what memory mapped I.O. looks like. Now, if we if we look at this same picture and go to some a machine like the x86 which is a different architecture and it uses um, it it uses this idea of port mapped IO and let's see what port mapped IO might look like so I'm gonna use a different uh, uh, color here just to see if I can get away um, so if I look at what port mapped IO looks like port mapped IO because there is a specific instruction because there's not it's not like you're just sending an address onto the bus because there's specific instructions this 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 one actually has an address for example the disk device on on um, on on the x86 machine if there's a disk it has an address like 3 zero x three f six and an address like x one f zero now the same address is also there here so these addresses are also there on the in the memory so how do we tell them apart well what tells them apart is the fact that in the address in with something like ax and when specified with x three f six tells it that this has to be channeled to that device and not the similar instruction which may be maybe there is an LDR instruction an LDR with if I use an LDR uh, to some dist uh, register X and if I use an X um, 3 F 6 then because this is an LDR instruction and not an in instruction this is targeted towards the memory so the CPU knows where it has to send this who it has to um, send this request to depending upon whether the instruction is a uh, load instruction which is saying load and store from memory or it's an in instruction if it's in instruction you don't have to um, you don't use the same address space as you would use in memory mapped IO uh, the individual device has so the device uh, has its own address space so so what happens in PMI port mapped IO is port mapped IO is also sometimes referred to as isolated IO isolated mapped IO because each de each uh, the device address space because the device address space is isolated from the memory's address space other than that they they basically achieve the same purpose um, because x86 is uh, is what we call as a as a as a CISC machine we have instructions specific instructions for doing things having having understood that let's take a look at how the um, various devices work we'll start with the keyboard and we'll look at first LC3's keyboard so here is LC3's keyboard uh, keyboard um, registers that we looked at the two device registers we talked about are the KBSR which is is which is called the keyboard status register as the name indicates and the data register which is the keyboard data register which is at 0xfe02 and the way this register works is it's 16 bits but as of now there are only two bits of interest to us bit 15 and bit 14 bit 15 is called the busy or ready bit and by by busy by having a value of 0 it's saying that the device is busy when the keyboard is ready it'll have a 1 so what does it mean to be ready? Ready for us is saying that it has a that the keyboard a key stroke 
has been performed and it also is telling us that KBDR holds the this one KBDR holds the the character the ASCII code of the key that has been struck and the KBDR is a 16-bit register but the first eight bits of the register are simply zeros and the remaining bits are where the actual character that the user typed is ASCII code for it. Now when it is zero it is it is saying that there is no new character zero is it's busy and in this case busy is probably not the best uh, uh, best term for it but it might be indicating that the it might be saying indicating that the the character in KBDR has already been read by the CPU that is there's no new character so a typical interaction with the keyboard looks something like this we will look at if I want to read a character, I'm going to, if I really want to read a keystroke, I'm going to look at the KBSR bit 15 and I'm going to check what its value is. If the value is zero, I go back and check again and I keep checking it till it becomes a one. When it becomes a one, I know that there's a new character. If there's a new character, then I can read it, read KB. DR. So this is exactly what our trap X20, which is in in our case a get C is doing on get C trap call is doing on on our system, except that it reads KBDR and puts it into register R naught. And this form of I.O. because we are repeatedly polling this bit. So we have this one bit which is bit 15. We are repeatedly polling this bit which keeps checking, checking, check it and keep checking. This act of repeatedly checking is also called polling. So that's where the polling is happening. Now let's look at another bit here which is bit 14. Bit 14 is referred to as the as the interrupt enable let's call it disable enable so disable slash enable bit that is if it's zero it's disable if it's one it's enable and we'll see what that means by taking and taking a look at what what the downside of doing polling is the downside of polling is that when a user requests a character this polling repeatedly happens and this is wasted cycles that is you're waiting for the user to type and the computer could be doing something else but it's not doing anything it's repeatedly checking the status bit so here is a possible alternative way of dealing with this. Say we have again our CPU which is performing some operation and I'm, I'm just thinking of the CPU executing some code and this is my main program and there's some lines that it's executing and somewhere in here what it does now is it does a special step which is it'll set up the keyboard for interrupt which means that it will take the KBSR and set bit 14 of the KBSR to be equal to 1 and what it's doing by saying that is it's telling the device this is our device it's telling the device 
I am not going to be checking this bit repeatedly. I could, but I want you to let me know when there is a character. So if there's a keyboard here where this the user strikes a key, then where the device is going to send an interrupt. It's going to interrupt the CPU. And we'll see more details about how the interrupts it interrupts work. But now what can happen is the main program having set things up is simply going to keep running whatever it's doing. Maybe there's a loop in which it's executing and so on. So it continues to run. And when the user actually strikes a key, so when the user strikes a key, right, and the user strikes a key, the interrupt is fired. And whatever I'm doing, I am going to be interrupted. So the main program is going to be interrupted. And what happens at that point is because the device caused an interrupt, the mechanism is very much like a trap, except that this is not a voluntary call. It's an involuntary invocation of a service routine. So what it's going to do is in response to that, there will be an interrupt service routine. Um, the interrupt service routine for the keyboard and we'll see how that works as we get, go along. So so the, the, the CPU will suspend, which will save state like we know before on stack, just like trap does. And then it br branches control to the key interrupt service routine and when the interrupt service routine runs, it'll the interrupt routine, service routine will finish and it'll do an RTI. And when the RTI happens, because we've stayed the state on the stack and specifically we'll save PC and PSR on the stack as before. And when an RTI happens, we are, we will restore state which means the PC that you newly restored will you, will put you back at the place that you ran. So this way, we are not wasting processor cycle, but cycles, but we are use, doing useful work and then you can resume and go on. So this might be the code where it's doing something repeatedly, but it doesn't have to be engaged in the act of polling in order to read do IO. So we'll get into more details about interrupt processing. So let's take a look at a display device. The display device is slightly simpler because the display device is not an interruptible device. It does not, has the, does not have the capacity to interrupt. So here is the display device. And um, this is much simpler, so I'm just going to... Um, look at it in a very straightforward way. There is a DSR, which is a status register. And again, it's bit 15 is gonna tell us whether it's busy or zero for busy and one for ready. Uh, what it's ready with is ready, read, ready to accept a new character to display. And busy zero means that zero in our case, in this case, means that it's busy working on the last character that was asked to be displayed. So the code becomes pretty straightforward then if I want to display a display a um, character onto the screen, I'm going to check this bit. And if it is zero, I'm going to keep pulling it to, till it becomes one and it becomes a one, then I can write to DDR. And in the case of trap, it means that we are taking what is an R naught and writing to that. This is what our put C does internally. To kind of put things in perspective, I want to take a, a device that is a little more complex. Um, let's take a look at uh, IDE. 
IDE um, stands for Integrated um, Device Electronics, um, and it's just a name for an of uh, that one of the commercial companies has given for discs. Um, but it is one of the most um, earliest technologies in in uh, in discs, and so I'm going to look at this as an example because. We, we don't have to just be limited to one or two registers. In fact, in the case of IDE, what we find is that there are more than actually several registers in place. So, the for example, there's a control register and a command register, status reg and a, a, a control register and a command register. Within the command register, we will focus a on, on this register because this is a lot like the status register we looked at and this is you can call this your status register and we can call this our data register not exactly um, there's not exactly a one-to-one -one translation but we'll see what that means so if you think of how a disk works we we can think of a disk in terms of its geometrical layout or we can think of the disk as simply a sequence of what we think of as sectors these are numbered sectors 0 1 2 3 4 and so on uh, internally they may not be like that but there is n sectors like that so so one of the things with the IDE device is there um, with with a disk like this is there is an address which is 0x3f6 and if you want to there is a there's an actual uh, some electronics on the disk um, just like the keyboard actually has a little microcontroller on it um, the disk also has a little microcontroller a little computer if you will on it so the reset is to reset it so when I want to reset it that's what you're doing if you want the device to be in able to interrupt you you will set that bit so if you put to memory contents of 0x in this case we're using 0x because that's the notation that is normally used but if I put to this location a value let's say a uh, value of 0x uh, I'm gonna put 0 in the most this nibble and if I put an 8 1 0 sorry if I put a one one zero zero which is c then i'm asking it to be reset if i put a zero x zero uh, d then i'm all not only ask sorry zero um, one 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 zero which is a e if i put an e i'm saying that i want to reset and also enable interrupt The interesting thing about this device is because there are so many locations I can access and that's not just one character that you're reading because there are many things, you have to give it an address and the address is given, address of the location that you're going to give happens to be a 28-bit address. And the 28-bit address, by the way, the LBA is what we mean by a linear, ad this is called a linear block address so if you think of the disk as a linear set of linear blocks then that's what the LBA stands for and that is a 28-bit address so how do I convey a 28-bit number well the 28-bit number is is can you be can be thought of as as 8 bits this is the low bit this is the mid uh, sorry mid byte this is the high byte and there are four more bits left and the four more bits are going to go into this location the top four of this 0x fx are are the lba of it so that's where um the top four bits so these are the remaining four bits so this is eight this is four eight eight and eight so that makes it a 24 bit but you specify them in these addresses and the remaining bits in that in the last one are used for um, for other specifications interestingly you not only say what location you want to read so for example you might be wanting to read these locations you'll specify this address as in your LBA 
your linear byte address, which is the 25. And then you can also say how much, how many you want to read. This is your sector count, if you will. A sector is defined as 512 bytes in this case, but you want to say how many of those 512 bytes you want to read. Um, the interesting thing now is how do I read it? Well, I have to read it in one byte at a time and the data port is your way of reading one byte at a time. So we'll not get into that details. Um, but but the other thing that we see is the status bit, um, status is not just one bit anymore, there are many bits that we have. We have a busy bit, which is different from a ready bit. There's an error bit. And the error bit, um, so when there is an error, if this bit error bit is on, if this is equal to one, then we can check this guy here and this guy will tell us what is the kind of error so for example if let's say there was an error in um, this guy if this one was on so this so if you look at it the nfs here are not founds so something that is not found is an nf error so you see these nf errors that are there um, this is a bad block error um, and, and there are other errors like that. So every time we perform an action, we can check the status bit to see the, the status, reg, the error bit to see whether there was an error. If there is an error, we can go and look at the error register and know exactly what it is. So this is what a more complicated device might look like. I hope this uh, answers the question of how device interaction works on modern day computers.